Hello and welcome to another edition of Bible Answers Fast. I'm Larry Fuller, the evangelist with the Bancroft Church of Christ. And today we're going to look at the question that is on a lot of people's minds and they get it wrong. They, they ask, what are God's expectations and can we all understand the Bible alike? And many people have the idea, well, you interpret it the way you want, and I'll interpret it the way I want, and we'll all be fine. Is that so? Is that what the Bible indicates to us? That's what we want to answer today. So, there's two questions involved. First of all, does God expect man to understand the Bible? And secondly, can we all understand the Bible alike then? First question we're going to look at is, does God expect man to understand the Bible? What are some popular opinions today? Well, uh, people say, well, we, we don't really need to understand the Bible. Is that true or false? Let's turn to John chapter 17. John 17 and 17. Jesus says, Sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. So God's word is truth, and we're able to be set apart or sanctified by the blood by it. John 8, 32, he would further clarify Jesus' word by saying this. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So, you don't need to understand it. I guess you don't want to be made free then. Free from what? Free from the uh, bondage of sin. And what the consequence that follows at the wrath that comes upon the sons of disobedience. So, yes, you do need to understand it. So that popular opinion is false. Another popular opinion is um, we need theologically trained people in a sem seminary to interpret the scripture for us, then tell us what we need to believe. The result is then, men are above us, between us and God. Is that true or false, that idea? Well, let's turn to 1 Timothy 2 and 5. It will indicate to us, 1 Timothy 2 and 5, that there's only one above us. For there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And we're going to also turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. And you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God in Christ Jesus. And 9 and 10, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous night. Who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. The point being, this is spoken to the Gentiles. There is no uh, special priesthood in between us and God. We are all like priests, living stones in the temple of God. So, that idea, that opinion is false. 
How about some examples that God expects us to read and understand? For example, in the Old Testament, the people of Judah had gone into captivity for 70 years, and the word of God was almost lost unto them. That's the reason, part, big part of the reason why they went into captivity. But after 70 years, they were allowed to go back. And Ezra uh, was responsible for reintroducing the law of Moses at that time. So Ezra 3, 2, Then Jeshua, the son of Josadak, and his brethren the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, arose and built the altar of God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings on it, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. My question is, how did they know it was right to build an off altar and to offer burnt offerings on it? Well, it was written in the book of the law. Here are two more examples from the same time period, the same book, the book of Ezra. Notice Ezra 3 and 4. They also kept the Feast of the Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings in the number required by ordinance for each day. My question is, where did they get the idea of having a Feast of the Tabernacles, as it is written? Another one from Ezra 6.18, but they assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem as it is written in the book of Moses. My simple question again is, how did they know which divisions to assign to the Levites and the priests? Because as it is written in the book of Moses. Let's make some observations now. Did God have a standard about what they were supposed to do? Yes. How did God relay that standard to them? By his Bible, by his word. Was it clear, plain, and understandable enough for them to read? Yes, it was, because they did it. And that leads to my next question. Was it clear, plain, and understandable enough to interpret and do it? Again, yes. Did God expect them to read and do it? Yes or no? And the answer we know is yes. Here's a New Testament or Covenant example. An interesting question was posed to Jesus in Matthew 19.3-9 regarding marriage and divorce and remarriage. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? So what was his immediate response? Have you not read? They could look up the answers themselves, but they wanted to trick Jesus somehow by that question. But he reminded them, have you not read? They can read it. They can understand it and know all about marriage and divorce and remarriage. So let's go on. Matthew 19, 4 to 9. And he answered and said to them, have you not read? that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, 
and the two shall become one flesh. And so then they are no longer what two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. Now, that's rather hard to implement, but it is the Word of God, and you can read it and understand it. Here it is again in smaller text to make way for the questions and learning I might have from verses 4 to 9. First of all, You'll notice in verse 4 and 5, God made marriage for A, one man and one woman, B, two men, C, two women, or D, one man and two women. What's your answer according to what is this written? Easy, one man, one woman. Notice in verse 5 and 6, Although man or civil authority may officiate the ceremony, they are joined or bound together by the authority of man or God. So who is it, man or God, that joins them or binds them by authority? It's God that does it. Likewise, in verse 6, what God has bound together, man has a divine right to separate. So a civil law can grant a divorce for just any reason like they do today. Is that true or false? According to this verse, it's false. According to the Bible. And therefore, a man has the right to divorce for just any reason. The original question. Is that true or false for the sayings of Christ here? Again, clearly that's false. So therefore, do you realize you just answered the question the Pharisees posed to Jesus? How were you able to do that? Simply by reading and understanding. How sure are you that your answer is correct? Is there any room for doubt? No. What does that teach you about the ability to know and understand the Bible? Does God expect us to understand it? Romans 10:17, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The second question we want to look at is, can we all understand the Bible alike? Popular opinions today, no, there is no absolute truth. You interpret it the way you want, and I'll interpret it the way I want. We'll all agree to disagree and have unity in faith, but diversity in doctrine. Is that true, that opinion true or false? Well, let's look in Amos chapter three and three. It says simply, can two walk together unless they are agreed? John 17, and once again, John 17, John 17, verses 20 to 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe me through their word, and they will all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus prayed that everyone would be one, have a 
the same mind, the same judgment, keep the same faith, etc., etc. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10. The Corinthian church was beginning to draw away from this principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 10, and Paul wanted to put them on the right path again. And this is what he said. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions. Another word for division is denomination. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So, what does the Bible render that opinion to be? We can all agree and disagree. You interpret the Bible your way and I'll interpret the Bible my way and we'll both be true. The Bible renders that opinion as false. Another popular opinion around the same idea is that there are many faiths or paths to the same well, which is God. Is that true or false? Let's look up in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, 4 to 6. There is one body one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father above all. And we know that Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So, what does that render the, this opinion that there are many faiths or paths to the same well? The Bible says that is false. There's one way, that's through Christ. One faith, one baptism, one God, one Lord, one spirit, one hope, etc. Another opinion is one must have faith then receive a miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit before you can truly understand the Bible. A lot of charismatics will tell you that. Is that true or false? The opinion is you need faith, then you're zapped with the miraculous Holy Spirit, and only then can you understand the Bible? That's their opinion. How does that stack up to Bible teaching? God says in the Bible, the Bible is the product of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3:16. All scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction righteous, that the man of God may be furnished or thoroughly equipped for every good work. And may we turn to Second Peter, Second Peter chapter one. Verses nineteen to twenty one. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rise in your hearts. That's the second coming of Christ, that's a day of judgment. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, not uh, the apostles or the prophets' own thoughts that they pass off somehow. 
not of any private interpretation. Verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible is the product of the Holy Spirit. And you can read and understand. Um, back to Ephesians chapter 3. Apostle Paul would indicate uh, in verse 6. That Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. And partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. It was not for the Jews only anymore. It was for everybody. According way back to the promise to Abraham. Now look in verse 3 and 4. How that by revelation, he, meaning Christ, made known to me, being Paul, the mystery, as I have briefly written already. What is the mystery? The Jew and Gentile in one body. Look at verse 4, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in that mystery. So you can read and understand the Bible, by which you gain true faith. And Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So that opinion is false that you have to have the miraculous measure before you can understand the Bible. Outright false. Another opinion is one must have faith. Well, that's when proven false. Need faith and then receive the miraculous measure before you can truly understand. Here's further proof of that. Matthew chapter 7, 24 to 29. On the Sermon on the Mount, with the crowd gathered round, Jesus said they should not only hear these words of his, but do them. And it would divide wise men from foolish men. If you hear only, you're a foolish man. If you do not hear at all, you're a foolish man. And you will not be able to stand at the day of judgment. But if you hear his words and do them, you will be likened to a wise man whose house stood firm when the storms came. If the above opinion were true, if they needed the Holy Spirit miraculously to be able to understand what Christ said, um, they would have to all be under the influence of this miraculous measure of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand and then be doers, right? Well, there's a problem with that then. Uh, John chapter 7 and 39. Jesus would say this. Actually, it wasn't Jesus, but the author uh, being John. He said, But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He did not die on the cross, and therefore the miraculous measure was not poured out until Peter, after Christ died on the cross at the next feast, declared the prophecy of Joel and preached the first gospel sermon. Then some Jews and Gentiles could receive it by the laying on of the apostles' hands. The crowd gathered for the Sermon on the Mount did not have any Holy Spirit influence, but Jesus expected them to hear, understand, and do what he said. God is not the author of confusion, 
His word of the Bible in general is rather simple to understand. For example, who can count to one? Ephesians 4, one God, one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one hope, one spirit. Man can easily learn God's eternal purpose. He has accomplished through the ages since creation through his Son, Jesus Christ. Man can easily learn what must I do to be saved. Well, John 8, 24, you have to believe that Christ is. Luke 13 and 3, you have to repent. Romans 10, 9, 10 and 9, you have to express or confess your belief in Christ. And then in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Granted, there are other parts that may be harder to understand, like Peter refers to some epistles of Paul, like Romans, uh, probably Romans and 2 Peter 3 and 16. However, Peter indicates that you start with the basics and grow in knowledge. May we turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And then as babes we advance to more meatier subjects like Romans and Revelation. So my question to you, are you hungry to learn more? Would you like further studies? Uh, we have a correspondence course with all the scripture references printed out within in case you don't have a bible you can learn that way you can phone me or i can phone you you can come to uh, a house or a, a public venue to learn more there are lots of options just let me know and here's our website from which you would have the avenue to contact me and find further information that's available. If you have any questions, if you feel I've misrepresented the truth, please be so kind to let me know them or let me know that fact. Thank you for listening today.